In the summer of 2021, the Sligo Neolithic Landscapes Group and Sligo County Council submitted a bid for the passage tomb landscape of County Sligo to be placed on Ireland's World Heritage Site tentative list. For Heritage Week, the group conducted interviews with landowners and community members around key areas in the proposed World Heritage Site, Carramore, Knocknaray, Cairns Hill, Ballygawley, Carrochiel and Caish. They were asked about their memories and experience of living among the Cairns and the need to protect these ancient monuments. Um, I suppose I grew up uh, right beside Carrochiel Passage Tombs and we'd have the land that actually runs into it. So um, you'd always have the memories of like meeting loads of people up there from all over uh, the world, I suppose, coming. And you're always kind of fascinated that they were taking the time to come and see something that was like right beside you. Well, I grew up in Ballincar and our house at home overlooks the Ballygawley mountain range and across to Knock Knocknaray and even over a little bit further over by Crohan. So I've been staring at this landscape all my life, but I never really recognised what it was I was looking at until more recently doing tours. I mean, last year we had a great tour for National Heritage Week with Sligo Neolithic Landscapes Group. And it was almost like the veil had lifted from the landscape and what had been, you know, hidden in plain sight suddenly became very apparent. And it's like, what are these little knobbly bits on top of the mountains? And, and what's that? And what's that? And how do they talk to each other? Well, when I was eight or nine, ten years of age, five or six of us from our, our village used to go up to the Cairns from the Boyle side, about half a mile of the Boyle side, which was about a mile up, straight up through the fields. First thing we came on was what we called the Giant's Grave. It's just under the rock and it's made of pure stone. And as a young lad, I crawled into the sea what they were like. And you know, they were lovely inside bed and the cross inside and uh, uprights and all and well preserved. And uh, You'd come out then and you'd look round and you could see from there to Cache to Arigna, Lockheed, down here to Sligo, up to Donegal Mountains. The whole vista, it's beautiful on a good day, Cropatrick on a good day. And then you had the Stirring Rock, which was over farther, which has fallen, unfortunately. But that was another thing, the monument there that was English at the time. And I can remember all those as clearly when a younger man, you know. You know, travelling up, the cairn just dominated everything. So, you, you knew there was a presence. You knew there was a that there was you were, you were in a defined area, but there was something else here. It wasn't just an ordinary landscape. I used to play here when I was seven or eight years of age and didn't know the the history of the place at the time. And it's only now that I'm really you know, found out anything today from this tour today that I got a sense of what's actually here. But. 50 years ago, either 70 or 71, I came with a group of students from UCD. Uh, we were down on a weekend in Donegal and we called into Sligo on our way back to Dublin. I wasn't living in Sligo at that stage. And uh, I have this memory of about two or three busloads of students just rambling over the fields here and seeing the landscape for the first time. It was mind blowing because we had been studying the material on paper and seeing some images, but to be here on the, on the day like that was just magnificent. And um, over the years, I'm now resident of the parish, living in Kilmacoan. And I remember as children coming out and kind of strolling around the fields in the landscape and identifying that little cyst box, being able to climb into the cyst box and look at the pattern on the wall. Now, we would have been maybe 10, 12 years of age at that stage, so it was very easy to get in. I suppose my great-grandfather was the first man to really map this area and map the tombs and record them um, and so that they were placed. There was a record placed of them and that was back in the early 1900s. I suppose we were always conscious they were here, um, but it wasn't really till the 1980s or so when this site was bought that really we began to realise that oh, they are there, you know, and we took them as just part of the landscape and part of the area. And in fact, when my father bought the land in the road, um, obviously the sites were preserved, but you know, it was then we became more conscious of these, the two stones, two, two stone circles that we had on the, on the land. Well, you were afraid more than anything else. You were, you were afraid. First of all, it was the, it were the, it were the spirits there. 
and then you were afraid was there badgers or foxes or something in them. Like, you know, you didn't know what was in them really. I remember um, the local uh, farmer landowner there, Johnny Walsh was his name, uh, since passed, but he used to he used to make hay with him during the summer and help him out. I would always be asking, well, what is that? And he'd go, oh, don't go near that, the fairies will get you. And so that was the thing, like, and there were always fairies there. There were fairies going from that cairn to the ring fort down to this isolated rock on the road. And it was Johnny that relayed those stories. And I guess in hindsight, looking back, um, you know, by way of telling those stories, it wasn't the fairies really that were the guardian. It was Johnny, the farmer, the landowner, and he was the guardian of the landscape at that stage in, in time. You just got to meet loads of people that was always willing to talk. They wanted to hear like what you had to say about the area and it was nice to exchange views because you got to hear why they took the time to come to your area to find out about the Karakeel Passage Tombs. Um, like even kind of I suppose Midsummer's Day and the longest day of the year, the shortest day of the year, it would always be fascinating to see all the people going up and maybe camping there or whatever else and, and just taking the time like yeah it's a great place because it's so I suppose it's out in the middle of nowhere, it's so rural but it's so multicultural and it's so um it's like a mini metropolis from people from all over the world that comes to visit it. You know, even today, as I was, as I was uh, having my cup of coffee after the tour, um, I was talking to some of the others, and I was asking why was everything kind of from from Knocknaray right around to Cairns Hill. Um, with Caramore as the centre and why did it not go the rest of the way around and then quite simply it's it's the rising and the setting of the sun from 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 this central point and you learn these things and our ancestors learned the landscape and they passed it down by word of mouth from one generation to another so that people got to know what, when the seasons were right for 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 planting and for harvesting and for rearing their animals and for breeding and for everything else and the circle of life continues but it follows it follows the sun i remember even as a child my father used to look out the window and he would plot the trajectory of the sun as it crossed behind the ballygawley mountains and over around knocknaray and it was always there you know so i've always had an interest in it well they point to the antiquity of the landscape to think that people have been working and living here for over 5,000 years, continuously. Uh, and that is the story of Ireland. It's a story of continuous settlement, continuous generation, regeneration, and um, to be part of that is, is immense. Our whole being goes back to this. You know, that everyone in Ireland, in Northern Europe, all passed through this phase of how they honour their dead and how they bury their dead, and it was part of the cycle of life. So really it is, the very base of history that's here. It's, it's, it's a modern landscape. You feel it's a modern landscape, but it's an ancient landscape. You, you, you don't feel that there's a whole lot of time between now and then. As a photographer, I'm always photographing it, so, so that this, this landscape keeps on giving. A lot of people drive by here and other places just see a few stones in the field, but when you when you actually hear about them and realise that this is our history, it's immensely important that they're preserved and people know about them and learn about them. We uh, need to be careful about what we have. We want to share it with the world, but we've got to protect and conserve at the same time. And I think government needs to take recognition of the fact that if you, it's, uh, if you overexpose something, uh, you also have responsibility to look after it. Well, what I think about them now is that they're the tombs of our ancestors and they should be protected just the same way as we protect our symmetries now, our new symmetries. Is it a feeling? Is it a, is it a need to identify? Is it, although we mightn't be related to the people here, but you feel that, yeah, you, you can care for their memory. Uh, as chair of the County Sligo Heritage Forum, uh, this is without doubt our most unique site, especially from the Neolithic times. and. It's something that we're privileged to have on our doorstep and I think we need to protect it and we need to make sure that it is protected but we also need to educate the wider world and bring the story out to people, our own people 
and visitors to the area. This is a huge asset to have here, but it has to be protected. A lot of this type of um, monument throughout the world are they're being threatened. And I think it's very important. I'm a great um, believer in the study of history. And uh, I think to understand where we are today, it's important to have an understanding of where we came from and our origins. Um, and the landscape is such an important part um, in the psyche of Irish people in particular. It's extremely important to us. So I think that's, it's very important to retain that, to keep a bit of ourselves and, and our past. Our next generations and the generations after that, to keep that memory alive and, and the history of what went on here 6,000 years ago. And, I, I'm so annoyed with myself now that it's only today that I've found out what I did find out and I haven't known it before now. But at least it'll be, I'll be able to talk to my grandkids now at this stage and tell them the history of when they're around here, what went on. Continuation of knowledge and the gaining of new knowledge is connecting us with far-flung societies and uh, that's, that's an evolving story and that's what I'm excited about to hear the staff today have been so enthusiastic about uh, new researches that are taking place and I want to compliment everybody who is adding to the story of Caramore. That makes it all the more interesting for us. I think it also raises questions about who we are going into the future. Like, do we want to be part of a community that continues to destroy the planet and the earth that we live on or do we want to be part of a community that stands up and says, no, we need to preserve this, we need to protect this. I think that's where, you know, Sligo people and people from around here really need to step up and I suppose join the campaign to protect uh, protect these sites and get behind the World Heritage Site bit. I would have concerns about preservation. Um, we we are the custodians of a very unique and extraordinary heritage here in Sligo, and um, it's remarkable in terms of its preservation. And I, I think that it's 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 up to us as the current generation to ensure that these monuments are preserved in situ for future generations. And also, it was interesting, I think it was Austin said, we all have 5% of the ancient DNA of our ancestors in it. So, or in us, so it's, it's, it's in us. And something is driving us to do this. And I think it's really, really important for future generations to ensure that this legacy that we've been given is continued into the future. It is a world heritage. It's there longer than Stonehenge, more important than Stonehenge, and it should be preserved and uh, it would give uh, it would give the OPW uh, uh, and the government a new base of finance to do what we're asking them to do, just to put uh, some semblance of order on this situation. We have something unique in the world here, you know. So let's kind of focus on it. I guess um, they mean a lot to me, I suppose, because they've been there for so long. Um, it's great to see the history and it's great, I suppose, with James. He's always asking questions now. Who built them? Why are they there? Whatever else. So I think they need to be preserved and minded so as that we can pass them on to future generations. So it's like, James, please God, when he gets big, he'll be able to tell in other generations his memories of them. And it's great to have a piece of history there that's there for thousands of years and hopefully will be there for thousands of years to come in the future.